All right. Good morning, everyone. All right, it's good to be here again. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Dinesh. Uh, I'm the pastor for Smack 2. And uh, I'll be bringing us to the second part of the introduction for Revelation, right? So we're going to continue with where Andrew um, left off last week. So let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to your word today, help us to listen with open hearts to hear what you have to say. And Father, give us your comfort. Teach us through your word and help us to respond to your word. So we commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in university, uh, we have a joke. A fox saw a rabbit in the forest one day, and just as the fox was about to pounce and eat the rabbit, the fox hesitated. Because while the rabbit has noticed the fox, it did not run away. In fact, the rabbit ignored the fox and was furiously typing something on a typewriter. Curious, the fox then asked, What are you typing, little rabbit? I am writing my thesis, the rabbit answered. What's your thesis about? A rabbit answered, It is about rabbits defeating foxes. A fox wanted to laugh at the rabbit. How can a puny rabbit even consider that foolish idea? The rabbit looked confidently and said, I can prove my thesis if you would just follow me. So the fox agreed. The rabbit and the fox walked into a cave and suddenly the fox saw a large shadow moving in the cave. Oh, what is that? The fox asked. The rabbit then smiled and said, this is my thesis supervisor. The lion rose up in power and glory and the fox never came out of the cave. And the rabbit continued to write its thesis. Now the point of the story for us university students was this. It doesn't matter what your thesis is about. What is really important is how powerful your supervisor is. <laughs> if you have a strong and powerful supervisor, you can get away with writing any thesis. Now, while this story is not totally relevant to our situation, after all, there's only so much you can stretch an analogy, right? But in some sense, we Christians are like rabbit facing the world that, like the fox, seeks to devour us, even as it persecutes Christians. And we will claim that we have a thesis, that we have to live a certain way, we need to believe in certain things, and we hold to certain hopes. And the world will look at us and think, how foolish. So where can we, like the rabbit in the story, find our confidence? So that we can bravely hold on to what we believe, regardless of how the world comes to look at us. Now our passage today might provide some food for thought. So let's continue looking at our passage today, the second part of the introduction, continuing from what we saw last week. So Andrew stopped at verse 8, and so today we come to verse 9. Now here in verse 9, the author, the Apostle John, is telling us that he is the brother and partner to those to whom he's writing this letter to. Brother, because he is a fellow believer in Christ. And we see here in verse 9 that he has been sent to the island of Patmos on account of the word and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember what Andrew told us last week, he isn't there for a nice beach vacation. Lah. Rather, Patmos was a place of exile for convicts. And the Apostle John is there because of his uncompromising faithfulness in proclaiming the gospel. Even to the point that people in power got angry and chucked him in the island. So John himself also identifies himself as a partner or more accurately, fellow partaker with the readers of the letter in the tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. Right? Firstly, he says he's a partner in the tribulation. Now, the term tribulation simply means a situation of great difficulty. Right? And in this context, it's talking about the persecution of the church. Now, some people see the fancy word. 
right? And they think, oh, this is talking about a very special event that's to come in the future, um, especially in light of how when you read about the tribulation described in Revelation, it's described with such fantastic imagery, right? But what we want to see is actually from this letter, he's saying that it's written to a people who are in tribulation already. Right? John is telling us that Christians in that time are in the tribulation, that they are in a great deal of trouble because of their faith. They are being persecuted and bad things are happening to them. Just like how John himself is exiled in Patmos because of his own faith. Because he's a fellow believer, he too is suffering just as they were. And to be Christian is to have tribulation or troubles in the world. This should be the Christian expectation even if right now we are not in trouble. And this is exactly what John also reported in the gospel about what Jesus told him and the disciples. Because in John chapter 16, verse 32, Jesus said, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And so this tells us that tribulation is something constant in the world to all Christians in all time and all places. Jesus declares it as a fact. Now, to be fair, it may vary in intensity and specificity. But in one form or another, tribulation exists for you if you hold to Christ and his teachings faithfully because the world will reject you. While reading Revelation can be a daunting task, because it can be a bit hard to understand, we also want to see that actually, we can see that this letter is relevant to the people who it was written for, and it was written to bring them encouragement. Right? This is not written to a bunch of people who had some secret revelation, some secret understanding, and they got it. And we actually can't get it anymore, right? It's not meant to be a secret book. It's not meant to be hard to understand. Rather, what it's doing throughout the book is that it is contextualizing the tribulation that Christians shall have to face and are facing. And ultimately, it reminds them of what hope they have when they see terrible things happening in the world around them. Now, we may not feel like we are living in tribulation. But even then, as we faithfully obey Jesus, we all know, right, this is Malaysia, you can run into trouble. And ultimately, if we just take a step back, expand our view, look at the church around the world today, you will know that there are places where to be Christian is to deal with severe problems, dangers, and risks. You can die simply for being Christian if you're in certain parts of the world. And perhaps there are Christians seated here today who are in persecution because of their faith. Even though many of us may not feel that persecution yet because our current context is different. So here, we want to see that John is reminding the persecuted church. He is their partner in their difficulty. He's sympathizing with them. He's identifying with them and he seeks to encourage them. And here the ESV doesn't capture this well, but John uses only one article, the, here, to refer to these three things. He's not saying the tribulation, the kingdom, and the patient endurance. But he's saying the kingdom, tribulation, and patient endurance. Right? It's a small distinction, but the implication is that he's actually linking all these three together into one unit. There is a connection between them instead of them being three separate things. So those who are patiently enduring the tribulation that Christians are facing, they are holding firm because they belong to the kingdom. And they belong to this kingdom because they trust in Jesus. So that's the secret here to this letter. 
John is writing this because he does not want them to be discouraged because of the persecution that they are going through. Because as they endure the tribulation, then they have the assurance that they truly belong to the kingdom because they are showing patient endurance in Jesus. In other words, they are living for Christ and trusting in his promises even when the world has seemed to gone mad. And that is the true mark of a Christian. Now we continue looking at verse 10 to 11. And we see that as John was in the spirit when he received this vision, he was commanded by a loud and powerful voice to write to the seven churches in Asia. This seems to be a specific letter written to a people in specific circumstances. It is possible that we may think it holds no real relevance to us. But if you remember what Andrew said last week about how numbers are used to represent things or ideas, then we want to see, right, that the number seven is used throughout the Old Testament to portray this idea of completeness, of wholeness. And so the fact that the number seven is used here implies that this letter is actually meant to the completed church. Right, symbolically represented by seven churches. And so if it's meant to the completed church, then this book is meant for all Christians from all ages. So actually when we read this book, we read it knowing that it is talking to us directly, even though it does seem to be instructions to particular churches in particular situations. So John is talking to these seven literal churches regarding matters that has direct significance in the context, but at the same time, he's also talking to God's complete church through this. So as we come to this book, we listen carefully because we are also the target audience, which is not to say you don't listen carefully if you read the other books, but there's something particularly written to you. Next, we come to verse 12. And then we see the vision described to us. John sees seven lampstands. Now, fortunately, understanding the meaning of the seven lampstands in this vision is very easy because verse 20 tells us. It's the seven churches represented symbolically in the vision. And we get this from the Old Testament imagery of the temple menorah, right? That is that one lampstand with seven candles. But here, we are seeing a larger, a more full imagery. It's kind of like if that menorah was meant to be a compressed icon to represent, you double-click it, it expands, and you see seven lampstands. Right? You see seven candles, seven lampstands. And so we see here that it's not talking about seven literal churches. And again, it's the same idea. Taking in the pattern of that seven is talking about the fullness of the church. So therefore, we know that John is being asked here to write to the one holy, apostolic, and Catholic church that transcends space and time. And that's why we know this letter is for us as well. We are recipients. And then John turns and he sees the owner of the great voice and he sees one like a son of man who stands in the midst of the seven lampstand. And we see in this description of this man that he has a long robe, golden sash, white robe, eyes like fire, feet like burnished bronze, voice like the roar of many waters, like the sound of a trumpet. And what's the point of this? Each description here is actually laden with Old Testament reference to help us understand and truly comprehend this. Who is this person? So when we see visions right, in the Bible, it often talks using the categories of the past to help us understand what we are seeing. So from the vision of Daniel, we see the one like the Son of Man who descends to approach God and receives all power and authority. And here he is like that Son of Man. In Daniel's vision, it is God himself who shone with white hair 
And that signifies his wisdom. From Isaiah, we get this picture of God's majesty, which is shown by describing that the, the end of his robe, his long flowing robe, the train, just the tip of it is enough to fill the entire temple. Right? And it shows how awesome God is. And here we see the speakers described as wearing a long robe. So you can see that so far it's mirroring the majesty and power of God. Then his eyes are like fire, right? Now, a bit harder to explain, but what it implies here is that he sees with clarity and righteousness. It's about um, moral right, seeing things the way they are. And the eyes is on fire, right? And so there's that, that righteousness, uh, that picture of judgment, that eye that will not be deceived but will judge. So he sees truly with a zeal for righteousness. So we cannot hide from this speaker. We cannot deceive him. He knows. You know from Exodus, the high priest wears a linen sash. And our speaker here wears a sash too. But his is more majestic. He's a golden sash. And he speaks with a powerful and fearful voice like a trumpet. Exactly like how God is described speaking to his people at Mount Sinai, where they heard it and they could not endure it. So as we read, we continue to find out more about him. As this speaker is continued, uh, continued to be described in verse 16, and we see then he's holding seven stars in his hands. And later in verse 20, thank you, verse 20, is explained to be the angel of the seven churches, right? Now at this point, we have to pause to wonder, right? And I don't know if you have the answer, but how do you write and deliver messages to angels? Have you thought about that? Now, one possible solution is to see that the term angel here originates from a word that simply translates as messenger. Right? And therefore, it can mean Heavenly angels, right? That's type with many eyes that you see, you want to ping someone and say, fear not, right? It can mean that angel. Or actually, it can refer to a person who comes bearing the message of God. He's a messenger from God, right? That's messenger. So if we consider that John is instructed to write his message to each of the seven physical churches here, by addressing the angel to that particular church. Most likely, the term angel here is being used to refer to the bishops or the pastor of this church through whom the word of God reaches the congregation. Right? Yeah, try, try calling Andrew Chia angel next time you see him. <laughs> so, these bishop or pastors, they function as God's messengers, right? As the word comes to them and they bring God's word to the congregation. So in that sense, they are the angel that declares. So what we see here now is this man, right? He's not identified yet, right? He holds the leadership of the entire total church in his hands. He has authority over the church. And when he sees his face, is described to be shining. Right? And we read about the transfiguration and we learn from there that Jesus' face shone, right? And not like the type that's reflected glory. His, his face is the source of the shining, right? And so here we see this picture of an encounter with God. Next, the man is described as having a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, right? I remember uh, teaching this in kids' church, asking them to draw, and like they all had this sword coming out, right? And again, this is a vision, right? It's trying to, to show us through, through images a biblical truth, right? It's meant to teach us something about him. So if we go to Isaiah 49, we will see that the servant of the Lord declares, God has made his mouth like a sharp sword. So it's actually his mouth, right? His mouth is like a sword that can cut through things. And the book of Hebrews gives us more context, right? Because it declares a sword that comes from the mouth is the sword of judgment which comes through the word of God. So it shows us that 
that this person, whoever he is, he speaks the word of God and he brings judgment, a real one that cuts through things. So we are seeing here this hint of awesome power and majesty, which actually we would only apply to God. And at this point, we will wonder, is who is this awesome man that's speaking to John? Now, you all probably guessed it, so no prizes. But in the next section, he continues, right? He gives us more clues to help us identify him. In verse 17, he says, fear not. Now, if you think about it, right? Think of all that John has experienced so far, right? There's a powerful voice, all this imagery, and he's getting it. Wow, this it's like God himself speaking in great majesty and splendor. The right response would be to fall down in shock as John did. Fear is the right response because we know we are in ourselves unclean, unworthy to stand before God. Yet this man comes to John and says, fear not. And if you know, this is something that Jesus himself has often reminded his followers and the reason he reminds them that is because he makes them worthy and blameless before God. There's no need to fear when Jesus is with them. Not because you are righteous by yourself, right? Even the prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel, they were fearful in the presence of God, right? But here, with this man, there is no need to fear. This man takes away the fear that comes from knowing our sin. Despite being in the very presence that caused even people like Isaiah and Ezekiel to fall over. Right, then he continues to declare, He is the living one who died and now is alive forever. Now at this point, the identity of the speaker should be clear to us. Lah. Right, if you haven't, then we need to read the, the Bible, right? But if we have read our Bible, if you know the Gospels, if you know the prophecies, then you know that Jesus is the one like the Son of Man, fully human yet also divine, who's alive and came to die on the cross. And having died in faithful obedience to the Father, he is raised up to eternal life and he sits on God's throne, ruling over and judging the world. He is greatly exalted. He's given the name above every name. And that is what's being shown to us through this vision. And so now we understand this great voice speaking to John is none other than Jesus himself, the living word of God who was with God and is God. So now we know that John falling down is not to be mistaken as a comical scene, right? It's not like some clumsy, bumbling servant. It is a genuine response to the fear of the Lord because the man that he sees is God, the Son, Jesus Christ. And we want to understand, right? Jesus appears in this way, shrouded in powerful, majestic, symbolic visions in order to reveal his glory, power, and majesty in such a way that actually his power and his function is not separated from his person. Right? The impact will be different, right? If he just appears, hey, hi John, Jesus here. Right? It's meant to evoke something in the readers because it brings to mind all these things about his identity and makes it clear this is who's before you, John. So the imagery therefore goes beyond words, strikes the reader right in the heart. And so as we take it all in, we also see that he's not only showing us how awesome he is, he's also showing us that he is the one who stands with the church and the church is in his almighty hand. And he is actually telling them, I am with you, even as he reveals himself in his majesty, so that the readers can be strengthened to put their trust in Jesus. Just as he has promised them, right? That he will be with them forever until the end of the age. And we see now that promise reiterated through this vision because we see him in the midst of the candles. So he is not distant. He has always been with the church through the tribulation that was and is going. 
Now the assurance that we have is not just in the glory and power that he reveals, it is also seen in the, solid, in the solidarity that he shows by standing in the midst. And more than that, he also declares, I have the keys of death and Hades. He has conquered, he is victorious, and he holds the keys in his hands. Actually, he's saying, don't worry, I know what death is. I have power over life and death. And he's implying, I can bring you back if I wish it. And this is something that the church must understand. In the midst of their tribulation, even as they were killed all day long like sheep to the slaughter, some were set aflame, some were thrown into the Colosseum, they are to see in this vision, or they are to know that Jesus stands in the midst of the church and he is not an important saviour. He truly has power over life and death. And if we understand that, then we know that the message that Jesus wants the church to know, even as he reveals himself, he tells John right to the church, is that the church is to look to him amidst tribulation. And so if we understand this, we also understand that the function of all the unveiling in this book, as we continue to read the rest of Revelation, all those terrible pictures of judgment and grace and proclamations of victory, everything here is for the sake of the church. It's here so that the church may be strengthened to persevere through tribulation. This book is not so much about merely foretelling the future, but rather, it is to help prepare hearts to encourage the church because the whole point of Revelation is to assure us, a spoiler alert, that despite how bad things look, Jesus wins at the end. And every tear will be wiped away. And those who persevere will receive the crown of life and the kingdom. So if we are to now look at the whole text from verse 9 to 20, now we can see the flow clearly, right? Verse 9 to 11, John is giving his readers assurance that the entire church is united in suffering. He points then the church to the hope that we really have. And it's not the hope that the suffering will end, that you will be victorious, right? That you're blessed already, right? He's not saying that. But rather the promise that he points them to is that we are promised the kingdom if we hold faithfully to Christ. Then verse 12 to 16, he comes and shows us how awesome and worthy of power and glory this Jesus that he said put your trust in is. So that we are to know, all right, if I put my trust in him, John is showing that he is worthy. He is capable of fulfilling his word. And so we are allowed to see Jesus in his glory through John. So that we know that as our eyes are fixed on him, then our fears and anxieties and worries are cast away. Because what he's showing us here is that he is the mighty conquering God who has stood by his people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so that's why the vision hinges on the usage of Old Testament categories, which is then applied to Jesus who comes in the New Testament so that we know that his promises of the old is still true, that he is forever, he is faithful to us. And then finally, verse 16 to 20, Jesus himself speaks to remind us, to assure us that he has conquered sin and death. And because he is with us, then we have hope regardless of how much struggles, suffering, pain and difficulty we are going through. 
Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And if we have this Jesus with everything that he's described and he's in our midst, what more shall we fear? We have a real and meaningful hope. His death and resurrection demonstrates that for us. Jesus died so that the problem of sin was solved through his sacrifice, so believers no longer have to worry about being good enough for God. Before God, fear not. Jesus has done what is needed to be done, so we can be forgiven, be at peace with God. And we also know that Jesus rose from the dead to show us that actually death is not the end. Right? So imagine... We are not in that situation, but imagine that we're all gathering here in fear because we read the newspaper. They say, you know, there's some people who want to bomb Christian churches, right? And we're faithfully here, trusting in God's word. And in the midst here, you see this man, like, oh, see with the corner of your eye, uh, wow, eyes like fire, long flowing robe. I think that's Jesus. Lah. Actually, will we be afraid? And that's what he's telling us. You might not see him here physically. But he is with us. And so we know that even if we die, God will raise us up again on that day. The sting of death is taken away. If we have Jesus, this mighty powerful figure who loves us, who cares for us, then death is nothing. Just like the story of the rabbit, the fox and the lion, we have the lion of Judah, mighty in power awesome in splendor, standing beside us as our strength. And truly, we can say, where is your sting, O death? We can look to the accuser and ask, where is your condemnation, sinner, sinner? They are conquered by the lion who is Christ. And we learn today that this lion of Judah, who have conquered the ultimate enemy, sin and death, now he gives us assurance. Hold firm, look to him. Even if the whole world is against us. And so are we doing that? Are we fearful of being faithful to Christ? Because we are afraid of the world. And if we do, we are not seeing him. Finally then, the passage helps us to remember that we want to read Revelation in the spirit that it was given to the church. It's meant to be an encouragement that Jesus is with us, Jesus is for us, church is in his hand, and it is meant to help us hold firm through persecution. So even if in the weeks to come, we're going to read things that seem so scary, there's the dragon, there's the beast, there's this, you know, bulls, of judgment and like you read it also you're like wow this is gonna happen i don't want to be alive when this happens right well remember it's not written to scare you jesus told john to write these things for a purpose and actually the purpose is to help us find encouragement in the knowledge that the world is in his hand he is the one that's decreeing all these things shall happen he is the one behind all that happens, and He is for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word, and we pray, Father, that, uh, that you will help us to be prepared for any tribulation that comes our way, that you will help us to love our brothers and sisters in tribulation, just as how John showed solidarity with the church. And help us, Father, to see Christ in his fullness standing in the midst of the church. Let us know, Father, that he stands with us, that he is for us. And through that, Father, we pray that you will remove all fear that we may have of the world, of the difficulty, of the suffering that comes when we hold faithfully to you. So help us, Father, to see that most important, we are to persevere in Christ so that we 
may then receive the kingdom, the crown of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.